So just as a quick uh, intro again, um, please take the pre-workshop survey if you haven't done so already and have sympathy for grad students. Um, at the end of today's workshop, um, sometime after today, please take the post-workshop survey. Um, again, it's all part of um, a study and sort of why everything is put together the way they, the way they are. One of the questions in the post-workshop study uh, essentially asks if the content for these two days were okay and if there's something that you think should have been taken out, you have, an, you have the chance to put that in. And also when we are putting together like round two for all of this stuff, what you would want to learn about because it's actually really hard to figure out what that second part is and finding the ordering for that. Advance, cool. Um, just as another thing, you can always go to the ds4biomed.tech website and that is the written prose version of everything we presented, uh, the slide deck and some of the papers. Uh, so I didn't really talk about it yesterday, but that spreadsheet chapter, there's an actual paper about, I think it's like 10 or 12 good habits of working with spreadsheets. Um, so there's a paper that roughly accompanies like the things that we talked about yesterday. And then if you ever have any tech related vocabulary questions, there was a glossary. Uh, for those of you on Zoom, just one more time. Um, this is an example of how you might want to lay out your screen if you have a single, uh, if you just have a single monitor. If you watch what's going on in the classroom right now, there's literally three screens and two laptops in front of me. So um, it's a little tricky if you only have one, but this is how you might want to lay things out. Um, so for today, uh, we're going to actually go through the process of showing you the fundamental topics of what clean data means and how to get to that point and how all of that ties together with visualization and statistics or running your own models and stuff. So it'll build all on that fundamental stuff that we covered yesterday in the spreadsheet chapter that all really builds on one another and then we'll see how that all applies and that's what today's uh, stuff is on. So. Just as a recap, um, we'll take uh, a couple of minutes um, to work on this. And this is sort of a recap from yesterday. Um, open up the same RStudio project that you did yesterday. Load up the Tidyverse and read XL libraries. Um, load that tumor growth Excel file into a variable called tumor using the read Excel function, and then filter that data set such that it only contains values from day 21, and then using that same data set, calculate the average size for each value of group. So that is roughly some of the stuff that we covered. That is, I think I, we covered all of this stuff yesterday, just use it as a recap. Um, on the right-hand side, there is some skeleton code for you just to sort of figure out. So I don't want you to actually need to know the functions to being called. So hopefully those pieces will help you along. And if you are done, you can put a done in the chat. Um, I've, I realized that I also today, again, forgot to bring sticky notes because usually I have red and green sticky notes for you to tell me that you're done in person. But Clearly, I am not used to being in per teaching in person yet. So we'll take a couple of minutes, and then we'll go over this question. And if you have installation issues, um, just let me know. We can deal with that. Um, for the people in Zoom, and just posted a link to the binder setup. Um, so if you have IT problems, uh, that binder setup will have everything set up for you. Uh, what I would suggest before you end for today, you can copy and paste the stuff out of Binder into like a text file on your own just so you have those files. All of the stuff that I am working on code-wise, um, at the end of today, I will give you the link to where all of the code that I'm typing is so you have a reference of something that worked in class. And then by sometime next week, all of the video recordings from yesterday and today will be on YouTube and then we'll post that out as well.
uh, we'll take one more minute before I just go over um, the actual solution through everything. Uh, let's go over this solution. The, whoops. I'm not totally used to this. All right, so the first part was to make sure that you have opened up the same project from yesterday so that you can see from the top right corner. Um, usually in our studio, the things that you have opened up previously will show up here and you can clear this list or you can go to open project and navigate to that same portion as before. And whenever you start working on a project, that's one of the first things you want to check right away is to make sure you're in the correct project. Um, it's pretty common that you work on multiple projects and you end up figuring out like, I want to load this data set. Why is it all of a sudden that those files don't exist? It's because you're in the wrong starting directory, that working directory that that project sets up. So we can confirm that that's there. Uh, remember from yesterday, you can still see some data set was loaded. Um, that's because I didn't really touch my computer since yesterday. So I'm going to hit restart R and it's going to clear that environment. So we're starting from scratch and should clear it. Um, and Let's do that again. Oh, I guess our studio, that button used to not be there. Um, so yeah, we will do that. Um, there's that clear workspace button. Technically that sweep button is a little bit different. I don't know how I ended up doing that yesterday because it definitely cleared yesterday. Um, but yeah, we want to make sure that that environment panel is empty when we start. As that's trying to figure itself out, the first part of the uh, question one was load the tidyverse and read Excel libraries. So that's library tidyverse. And I'm, I'm going, going to run, run that right away because it's going to take a while. And then the other library we're going to run is read XL. And that is the library that gives us the ability to load up Excel files. Um, the next part was to save the local tumor growth Excel file in the data folder, load that up using the read Excel file uh, function and then saving that to a variable called tumor. So we can use read underscore Excel, and then the file is located in data slash, and the name of the data set is medical data underscore tumor growth dot SLS. I really hope I spelled that correctly. We will figure that, we'll find out really soon, as soon as things get loaded. Um, then remember that we are using that arrow function to assign something. So the thing that gets loaded on the right hand side gets assigned to the thing on the left hand side. And I said, we're going to call this variable tumor. And eventually the computer will catch up. <laughs> So once we have that uh, tumor data set loaded, um, the next question was filter the tumor data set such that it only contains values from day 21. So remember from yesterday, we can use that piping notation. So it's tumor uh, pipe. So the way you can pronounce that symbol, um, people have convened on using the word then. So it's tumor then filter. 
um, and then its day is equal to 21. So remember, it's double equal. The next part was then calculate the average size for each value of group. So we're going to take this data set, pipe it into another part. So that question was, we want the average size for each value of group. So when you have a question that's formulated like that, that's a trigger in your head that you're trying to do a group by operation. So it's first we want to do that splitting of our data set first. So that's group by. And I said group by each value of group. So it's going to group by group. Then uh, I'm saying to calculate the average size. So the average is using the mean. The mean is a summary function. So we're going to pipe, pipe that into summarize. And then we're going to say ABG is equal to the mean of size. And this computer is dying. <laughs> um, so hopefully that ends up working. I'll just let that run. Um, so the main things to keep in mind, this is, whoops, this is part of the reason why that piping notation is so useful because you can imagine if this was all contained into one set of function calls without using the pipe, the outermost thing would be summarize by group by by filter on tumor. So you have to read it inside out. This allows you to say tumor, then filter, then group by, then summarize. Um, it kind of reads a lot more like English, which is a good thing. Um, and if you want to get a general, oh no. What was that error message? Mm, oh, okay, that's just a warning message. So you should get some kind of result that looks like this. Um, and so this is the average tumor size for each treatment group only for day 21. So that's why the sizes are re relatively large. And for group one, which is the control group, which typically means nothing or just standard of care was given compared to the other treatment groups, seems to be the largest 21 days into the study. So that roughly makes sense, assuming that the other treatment groups are like quote unquote working. Cool. I'm going to save this. Um, I'm just going to call this 03 and I'll call this recap. I'm going to create a new um, thing just to start off for the things that we want to talk about today. Um, because my computer's tidyverse thing is taking forever to load and I'm not going to do that again, I'm going to use this little clear objects thing. But typically, you want to restart R just so like your libraries get restart as well. So uh, that should that should hopefully fix things on my end in terms of speed. Okay, so first topic for today. Hopefully, it'll, it'll it should take roughly an hour to go through this. Um, is about cleaning data. And so when we're talking about cleaning data. This is one of Allison Horst's diagrams about wrangling data or cleaning data. That's sort of the terminology that you'll see on the internet. We'll be going over this paper written by Hadley Wickham. He's currently the chief data scientist at our studio. Uh, he is the reason why Tidyverse exists. Um, all of that select filter, that's all under a package called dplyr. Um, that's his package. Um, in the next hour, we'll learn about plotting, which is using ggplot2. That was his dissertation project. And so uh, we'll be going over this paper he wrote about tidy data, or what does it mean to be a clean data set? And these are literally screenshots out of this paper. So we'll sort of walk through this paper as, a, as like a journal club, and then also code up all of the examples in this paper. So he talks about, here's a mock treatment Example, we have three patients, John, Jane, and Mary. They have two 
theoretical treatments and then some kind of value associated with it. And in this data set, this is one representation of the data for that study, right? So if you are like that first example yesterday when we were talking about spreadsheets, if you were manually curating your data set, maybe this is a form of the data set that you will manually curate because this is a good way to visually check yourself um, what's missing or what's what kind of looks off, right? He also makes the case that if we literally flip the rows and columns, like do a transpose, this is another view of the data set. Um, and really no bits of information is lost. It's really just a different view of your data, right? So maybe if you have a million patients, maybe not have it in this view because we know about like column limits of things. So if you only have a few treatments, probably the first way would be the way you would manually curate. The problem with this and the other form of the data set is, um, let's say I wanted to say, uh, think about the exercise we just did. Uh, I want to group by treatment value and give me the average reading for that patient, right? Now we're thinking about our data in columns and in both formats that we were just talking about, doesn't really lend us to that way of saying like, group by treatment, average of value. Right? We can't really just pick two columns for us to say that. And so he makes the case that if our data was structured this way, which is probably, it might not be the way that we would put it in if we were manually curating data, but this is the form of data that a computer would want if we were to do statistics or figures or, an out or, or some other group by aggregate calculation, right? There's more text, it's taking up, like there's certain bits of information that are duplicated, like the name, but now we can easily ask the question and you actually have the code from our previous example of we can group by treatment and get a summary by calculating the average of that result, right? And so if you ever are approached with a data set and you can't like sort of ask that question and your data doesn't, is not in that way where you can pick columns to feed that question, then you might end up in a situation where you have to do some of the data processing that we're talking about or will be talking about um, in this block. And so this tidy data is really a, a definition that describes what does data mean to be clean because data can be messy in all sorts of ways. But when we say data is tidy, there is more, this is, there's like a more object, objectable way of describing clean data. So we talked about some of these things yesterday about like every cell just contains one measurement. So that last point, each cell is a single measurement. It doesn't contain a color to say it's bad. It's just the value. Um, the other important thing is each variable forms a column. So the uh, problem with the original two things was there was a treatment A column and a treatment B column. That's two, that's not really a variable. The variable should have been treatment type, treatment type A and B, right? So each variable forms a column, and then each observation forms a row. So we have for a particular patient, the type of treatment they were on and that value, and then making sure that each cell really only measures one thing. If there's two things encoded in that cell, then we have to do some processing to split that into another column. So that's really important when you're curating your data sets. So remember yesterday, sure, you can use column to flag something that you need to fix later on, but make that flagging like a separate column if you're gonna use a color in your um, Excel sheet. Um, that way when it gets loaded, we can use that filter operation to say filter on bad or value equals bad, right? So we can do stuff like that. So what's really nice is there is a set of generic tools that can take almost any kind of messy data set and turn it into a clean data set. So even though data gets is messy in all sorts of different ways, as if you can picture how to convert from like those first two tables I showed to that third one, that those transformations are using the same exact tools. So the tools and functions I'm gonna show you should apply to almost any type of messy data set. The hardest part is identifying which one of those functions um, you're going to be using. And so what's really nice is once you have your data in a tidy format, 
then there's so many other tools, whether in R, Python, in Tableau, whatever, that can work on that data set. Because now, whatever system you use, you can say like, hey, I want all of the colors in this figure to be determined by this one column. So now you can point to individual columns and a lot of tools are built around handling that kind of thing. So what are common data problems? Um, I guess it's harder to see um, what the actual problems are talking about, um, but we'll go through each one of these columns. So the first uh, person here is saying, my columns are values and my rows are variables. Another type of problem is you have variables in your columns and your rows. And then another problem is you have multiple variables in a single column. And then the other one is like, I have no idea what's going on. So we'll go through each one of those problems. And these are usually the most general types of problems. And as you fix that problem, you fix a bunch of other problems with your data set. And so that is the, pro um, that is the example of cleaning data. So the first type of problem that we'll encounter is column headers are values, not variable names. So in this example, this comes from, this is data coming from the Pew Research Center about uh, for, for a particular religion and income bracket, how many people fit in that group. And this is a really nice view because if this was for a published paper, this is pretty space efficient as a view. So if you remember those first two tables, they're pretty space efficient. Um, but that third view just had a bunch of duplicates because the name was duplicated, um, would take up more space. So this is an example of your column headers. So these income values are values, but they're not variables, right? So what we should have is a column called religion, a column called income, and a column called count, right? So um, what I would do every time I give get a brand new data set, and I actually do this, and I do this still, I still do this when I'm trying to figure out what my question is, and I'm given a brand new data set, is I take out a piece of paper, and I write out roughly what I have, and then roughly what I want. So we want those three columns, religion, income, and value. And once you identify where you're starting from and what you need, it becomes much easier to figure out which one of the data processing steps or functions that I'm going to show you, you need. This particular question also comes from a question from yesterday, so that, that part that I wrote on board. So if it's in this format, you can ask the question of like, I want to find the religion where I have, like, let's use Hindu as an example, um, less than 10 people under the un less than 10K bracket, but also less than 10 people in the 30K bracket, right? So if I had a column that was just religion, income, and value, which is the next slide, if I had a column like this, I can't actually filter on that because I'm trying to filter on two types of income at the same time. So this is the format that we want if we're trying to do statistics, but it's totally okay to use the other format to answer your other question. Um, and you can very easily move from one format to the other. So that's the other really cool thing um, about using a programming language to do this is you can save out that other version for whatever question you need. You can literally do this pivot um, in Excel, it's like a pivot table call. Um, you can pivot your table and save that out as a totally separate data set, and then you have the same bits of information. They might be used for different things. So the thing that I was just showing you, hold on, I think this actually, um, there's an actual picture. And now this is gonna take forever to load. <laughs> um, that, that relationship, between those two views of the data is there is a wide view because there's more columns and then there's a long view where there's more more rows so that notation or that word this is the stuff that you literally will google is what is the going from wide data to long data that is the transformation that we're going to do so you can see here like all of the bits of information are nothing's really being changed it's literally just a different view of your data set one view is clearly more compact, and the other view is what we can use if we're trying to run those aggregate statistics again. And cool. All right, so we are going to go and work on that data set. 
So we should have Tidyverse loaded. Um, if you don't, I would load up Tidyverse. So technically, when we load up Tidyverse here, it is loading up a Tidyverse, when we loaded up, you notice that it had a whole bunch of other libraries being loaded. The actual set of libraries that we're working on right now is the tidyr package. So Tidyverse sort of helps us and loads everything that we would probably want. But if you're trying to look for more specific things, we're technically using the tidyr library. All of that select filter stuff that we were using yesterday, um, that's all part of the dplyr library. So. Um, it gets a little confusing when you're starting off with R, and I remember the first time when I was learning, I was very confused how the instructor just knows all of these packages, but it's pretty much like you end up using the same ones over and over again, so you will eventually learn them. Um, so just before I start again, I'm going to save this as 04 tidy, just so I can hit Control S and save things along the way. We're going to use the uh, read CSV again, uh, function again. So I'm going to load up the tumor data set. It's going to use the read underscore CSV function. And this time we're going to use the tumor growth uh, long data set. And it's long because this is the example of turning it into a long data set. So this particular data set has 37 observations and 32 variables. It is, it's actually the same data set that we've been working with, except I converted it into a different view. So if I simply look at uh, or run just the tumor variable, or I can click um, the little picture here to view the entire thing. Um, I'm not gonna click it just because some people might actually be looking at the code. You'll notice that we have uh, group ID and then here as separate columns um, the day in the study All right so in this particular view you can actually ask the question of not like yesterday it was like on day on day 13 not everyone has a day 13 value um, in R if you see a NA that stands for uh, I don't know if it, it's an acronym for something, but it, it's how R represents a missing value. And so you can ask the question of like, I want all the values in this row where patients have a value for day zero, but also has a value for day 13. Um, so this is the view that we can do. We can filter on that. Um, and I can go through that at the end of this example uh, because you can't actually double equal for an NA. Uh, because NA stands for a missing value. It, it can be any um, number. Um, this is more, this is sort of the reason behind why it's set up that way. It goes into how databases work and all of that. But you can heuristically be like, this can be any value. This can be one, this can be 10. So does NA equal equal NA? Uh, you don't know. So if you ever get back NA values back when you expect the number, um, it's probably because you had like one of those NA comparators and it's just like, I don't know, I can't actually tell you because missing doesn't necessarily mean the same missing. Okay, so how do we turn this into the longer format? So the problem with this is if we look at our data set and we see a bunch of columns and those columns are all part of like one count, that's how you know that you want to go from this version to this wide version to a long version, right? So if I look at my columns, clearly these are, at least since I know a little bit about this data set, we know that this is, those numbers represent days. The other thing from yesterday, you notice that um, column names need to start with a letter and if you wanted to start with a number, you see this back tick. So that is the key to the left of the number one on a standard US keyboard. 
um, you if you want to reference that column instead of just typing zero in select you have to hit back tick zero back tick right because that zero is going to actually represent like a like a positional index or something um, so that's also a reason why things start with letters okay so how do we go from wide to long so we take our tumor data set we are going to pipe it into a function and because we get to, because I'm teaching you after they did a whole bunch of changes, the name of the function is called pivot underscore longer. So we're going from wide to long. So we're pivoting it into a longer format. And then from pivot longer, the first thing that we pass in is the data set that we want to pivot. So we're, in this case, we're piping it in. So we don't have to specify that data set first. The next parameter that we pass in are the columns that we want to pivot longer, right? So we mentioned yesterday using that colon operator to slice a whole bunch of things. So we essentially want to go from the column that says zero all the way to the column that says 28. Yes, question. Oh, sorry, it's pivot, P-I-V-O-T. Yes, so that is the typo. So it's pivot longer. So we can say zero of starting from the zero column, not the letter O. So it's zero colon back tick 28. Uh, we can do that. And if we run this bit of code, uh, there you go. We've pivoted our data set, right? So if you end up in a situation where that's your data format, you can run this pivot longer. If that's the only code you ever use for R because you need this other thing in Excel, I am totally okay with that. One thing that we I wanted to mention about this, um, oops, that's someone's email that's on my clipboard. I guess as far as things on my clipboard are concerned, that's not too terrible. <laughs> So you can imagine um, this 28, like we know we're gonna start from zero. Um, and currently in our data set, you notice how I manually have to go look to see what that last column was. So let's say this study, like all of a sudden from an IRB update goes to 60 days. Our code now only goes to 28. So that's something that you might miss um, or something you have to be very, uh, you have to just know about. So in, tidyverse world when we're trying to select a bunch of columns they give us a, f a bunch of other useful functions we can select on so instead of just saying if we know the last column is 28 or we just want the last column there's an actual helper function called last underscore call and if we run that function so it'll look weird it's last call round brackets and then closing set of round brackets for pivot longer Last call will essentially auto or figure out what the last column in your data set is, so you don't have to go and search for it. So that's something that's super useful. Um, if you are like me and you are trying to, um, you work with survey data, there's an also function called like contains, um, where you can say like, I want all the questions that contain Q3 point something. Um, and it'll give you all of those questions. So there's a lot of other uh, useful things. Um, the thing you want to look at, look up if you're trying to look up all of these features, if you have your uh, cursor right before, between the L and the open bracket and you hit F1, so that's how you get the help function um, in our studio. Um, eventually it'll open. All of these things are technically under something called tidy select. Um, if you look up like tidyverse selecting columns, you'll get the Google help page on um, all of the other functions you can use. So last call is one of those useful functions. One other thing, when we try to clean up our data set, you notice that it gave us two new columns and by default, it was called name and value. Uh, we can fix that. So if we are cleaning up our data set, we might as well make um, column names that start that makes sense instead of just using the default values. So in here, there's a parameter called names underscore two, and we can set that equal to uh, day. And then this function takes a, also another parameter called values underscore two 
and we can set that to size. And the stuff that I'm working on, I'm going to use it as lowercase and I'll just keep the weird uppercase stuff um, in this data set. Um, if you're doing a whole bunch of column renames, there's an actual package called janitor. And in, jan in the janitor package, there is a function called clean underscore names. And if you pass in a data set that, what it will do is um, if you have spaces at the beginning, end, and in the middle of the beginning, spaces in the beginning and end, it'll get rid of them. Spaces in the middle, it'll replace it with an underscore and turn everything lowercase. Um, so there's, that's a really useful function if you have some weird person working in Excel trying to center your column names. Because there's a difference between a column that is called size and a column that is space, 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 size, space, space, because they're trying to center that thing in the Excel view. Um, something that's root that's something that's really hard to figure out when you're looking at it in programming view um, so running that clean names function sort of fixes a lot of that stuff for you so if i run this function now with the names to and the values to feet um, parameters if i look at my data set i now have a column called day and a column called size and instead of column called uh, name and value So now that we have this data set, we can, if we want, we can save this uh, to a variable called tumor under, sorry, underscore tidy. And we can save that because we're, we've essentially cleaned up this data set. And now we can do other things with it, right? So now I can ask you um, group by the group and day and give me the average uh, size for every one now, right? So before I couldn't really do that because the day was spread out across columns, but now that we've pivoted this into a longer format, we can then calculate that average um, calculation, that average tumor size. So because this data set has NA values in it, we have to do something a little bit different. So this example will sort of show you other things to do as you are processing your data set. So we have our tumor tidy data set, right? And what is the question that I'm trying to ask for each value of group and day? So that is a group by operation. So for each value of group, comma, day, and so group is going to be uppercase because that's part of the original data set. And because after we did that pivot, uh, we gave it day as lowercase, so be very mindful of the um, case difference. Then just like the example that we had at the start of today's class, we're going to summarize. We're going to say average size is equal to the mean of size. So size is that new column that we got pivoted down. And so if we run this, um, it's going to be a problem in some of the data that gets put out. You'll notice that a lot of these values are missing. So if we look for group one, day uh, one, it says NA, but we know there's definitely some values in there. Uh, and the reason why it's NA is the same reason why I mentioned before, NA doesn't equal anything. So when the computer is trying to calculate and it gets to a count and it's trying to sum up like 10 plus NA, it doesn't know what it is, so it gives back NA. And then now any other calculation that it's trying to do is gonna return NA. And that's what's going on in this mean function. So when we're doing with mean and you see like NA values, in the mean function itself, there is a parameter called NA.RM. So that's NA, RM is, comes from other parts of programming, stands for remove. So drop the NA values, and we set that to true. So that's T-R-U-E in all caps. Sometimes if you look at people's code, um, they'll use a single capital T. Um, I highly advise you not to do that because you can actually set capital letter T to a data set. And then now the rest of your code where I expected true as the value is now that data set and things are gonna go horribly wrong. Um, but you cannot assign T-R-U-E anything. So I would highly suggest you use spell it all out 
instead of using the single letter uh, version of it. And depending on whose code you're reading, um, you might see it. Um, just notice, just remember if you see it, just be very mindful that no one set like T um, to an actual value somewhere. So now if we run this, we actually get values back uh, because this isn't changing, sorry, when it gets to an NA value, so if it's doing like try to find the average of um, one, three, let me find numbers that I can actually do in my head, um, one NA five, it's doing one plus five divided by two, right? So that NA is not being counted part of the denominator. So it's literally getting dropped out. So don't worry about like, oh, if I'm dropping NAs, it's still counting them as part of my data set. No, it's not part of the denominator, it's dividing. So, so the, the other, other thing that's, that's sort of weird, weird and this, this is why um, the more you work with programming or maybe if you're really like, uh, you really like your files to be sorted in a certain way, why a lot of people in, in the computer world prefer year, 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 month, month, day, day in their dates is because of how things get sorted. So you can see here, remember yesterday when I said like, if you're gonna number your files, like just use that two digit number, this is sort of the reason why. Because if we sort one to 28 in character mode, it, we're gonna get zero, one, 10, all the way down to two. Right? And that's because if you look at um, what got printed, so this is a tibble, you can see the day character, the, that day column is being read as a character, not as a number. So we can fix that. Um, we can pipe this. So remember, we don't have to save every single intermediate. We can just keep piping things over and over again. Um, so even this tumor tidy. Technically, if I really wanted to, I could just keep piping this down. And sometimes you'll see that. Um, some people just do all of their data processing. Um, what actually happens is people break their code up into all the individual pieces. Once they know everything works, they go back and turn it all into one giant pipe piping code, right? So it's not like you write code perfectly the first time. There's no way that actually happens. Um, I definitely don't do that. I'm all for just get your code working first and then go back and make sure everything is correct and then go back and make sure, and then you can go and make it prettier. So just get it working and then make sure it's correct, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, question. So the question that that student was having was they ended up in a scenario where like I can I can literally replicate that error message if I run this. Um, essentially, it was like this thing wasn't found. Um, if you ever see that, it pretty much means that the thing that you were trying, you either typed it wrong here or you typed it wrong up there. Or when you tried to save it, it didn't actually save because there was an error somewhere else in your code. Um, and that object didn't get created. So that's, that's when you go back and it's like, okay, where's the first time I thought I typed this and then try to run that, rerun things from there. Okay, so we're back to this um, summarized part. So I'm at the part where we are trying to figure out and fix this day being read as a character and we're trying to make it so day gets read as a number. So this is more of uh, vplyr functions in the tidyverse. Um, so I showed you select and filter yesterday. Uh, summarize was also yesterday. There's another function in here called mutate. 
the mutate function is if you ever need to make a modification to some column, either you're going to create a new column or you want to, um, in our case, convert this column from character to number, you use the mutate function. So mutate means we're going to mutate some value in our column. So we're going to re overwrite the, um, actually, we, we can either overwrite it. So we can say day is equal, or I can create a brand new column by saying day num is equal. So you can use mutate to create new columns based off of existing columns, or run a calculation and replace the uh, original column. So in base R, there is a function called as.numeric. So what this function does is any vector that you give it or any column that you give it, it will turn it into its numeric representation. So here we're going to say we're going to pass in the day column. We're going to turn, convert that into a number, the number representation or the numerical representation, and then set that to a new column called day num. You can also set this back to day and it will calculate and overwrite it. So um, it's sort of your pick on how you want to do it. Um, in this example, I'll just show it as a brand new column. In the actual notes, I overwrite the original one. So in this example, you'll see that day num is now a number. Um, and now, what because it's a number, we can now sort on that column, right? So another function in the plier um, is arrange. And so now we can arrange on different columns. So let's say we want to sort first by the group value, and then we want to sort on the day num value. And once this is done thinking, um, now we should have a data set that is in tidy format and also um, sorted in a way that makes sense. So now we're in a position to like export this out and we can give it to someone else and we don't have to worry about them being like, hey, can you actually give me this data set back so I don't have to like in Excel click the buttons to arrange it every single time? Like you can do the arranging yourself. If you want to reverse the arranging, um, arran the way it, like instead of ascending, do it as descending. I think you wrap the whole thing around descend. Hold on. Let me like run this first before I start talking. I think if you wrap the whole thing around descending, is that the way to do it? Yes. Yeah. So if you wrap that whole uh, variable around descending, you can sort by, so in here I'm sorting by group, which is four, three, two, one, but I'm still ascending on day. Um, so you can do that as well. And then, you know, you're free to write .csv or write, um, so write underscore CSV or write underscore Excel, save this out as needed. And so that covers like one of the most important things of going from that wide format to long format, right? And the way we, um, if you think about like what are like, like bad, bad data smells, if you think about it that way. Like what are these bad data smells when you look at a data set? If you see a bunch of columns and they're like, wait, those literally all represent the same thing, um, you might have to go do that pivot longer step. Um, I say might because maybe your first question is, it, does, it doesn't need to be in that format, but somewhere along the line, you might end up needing to do that long format, especially if you want to do like aggregate statistics and stuff like that. Um, cool. So the next question or the next problem um, is multiple variables stored in one column. Um, data sets like this is super common when you download data from the CDC. Um, that's usually where I see a lot of this stuff. Um, for this particular data set, this comes from the WHO. This is also an example out of Hadley's Tidy Data paper. Um, this is tuberculosis counts for each country and year. And up here in the columns, this M014, et cetera, et cetera, uh, stands for males age 0 to 14. And then you have males age 55 to 64, or males 65, or male unknown. And then you have the same set for female. Um, why would you want data in this format? Honestly, like if it makes your data collection easier, you can do it this way. Um, 
but we'll show you how to make it into a tidy format. So the problem here is if we look at, so the one thing that you'll notice is we have the same problem as before, where like these columns really should be like in its own thing. Like there's multiple columns that is spread out across the data set. Like they all measure the same thing, some gender and age group, right? So that's sort of like that code smell or really data smell where you want to do that pivot longer operation. But the problem is if we look at this number here, I don't even know the uh, two digit country codes. So if anyone knows what AE stands for as a country, um, so AE and the year 2000, has a count of two, what does that two represent? It represents gender and age group, right? So what did I say about like yesterday about each cell should only represent one thing? That's breaking that rule because that cell represents two things. So take out our piece of paper, given this data set, what are the columns that we actually want? We want a column called country, we want a column called year, we want a column that says gender, and we want a column that says age group. So the first part, if we look at this left example, if all we did was take everything we learned in the previous example and pivot it longer, we get this example on the left, right? That's part of the way there. Um, but now we have that one column where that first letter stands for age group and then the rest of it stands for, sorry, the first character stands for the gender, the rest of the numbers stand for the age group. So if I were to just like forget coding at all. If I were to give you M014 and I say like, how would you, without even thinking about how to code it up, like split that? You might say like, just draw a line down like that first character, right? So think about little cookie crumbs that you would leave yourself if you're curating your own data. Um, I personally always use like dashes or underscores uh, because I would end up doing something like, um, if I break everything apart by the underscore instead of by the first character, I can have a left-hand side that is the gender and a right-hand side is gonna be that number, right? We're not exactly gonna get a data set this pretty in this example, but you can see if I somehow had a function that can literally separate based off of like that first character, I can turn that left-hand side to the sex column and then everything else would be the age column on the right, right? So we can actually go and do that. So let's go and use and load up this particular data set and see how we can actually go and clean this data set up. Because it's uh, tuberculosis data, I'm going to load up a data set and save it to a variable called TB. Uh, we actually have this data set in that packet um, in our data folder. So it's gonna be data slash TB underscore long dot csv right so the data set itself is not in long format again this is sort of my naming convention when i was putting together this stuff um, this is the data set for tv that we will use for the long example so maybe I, it's not a good naming convention but that's sort of just what i did when i was putting things together um, so here we go. We have that same exact data set from the paper um, loaded up in our TB uh, data set. So one of the things that I totally didn't really um, say, it's sort of like, this is also like one of the things I do as a habit. Um, so I ran this code um, and it loaded up the data set, but it didn't show up automatically. And that's because what I did under the hood or I, I yeah, I don't expect you to actually see when I'm running it. All I did was select the TB. So it only runs the, that variable and it printed it out to the screen. Um, so that's how you can load up a data set and then check it. So what I should do is run TB underneath 
and then that way it will load and then print out what it can um, of what it's loaded. And this is the same thing as literally clicking here and running and viewing it, um, viewing the full data set in like spreadsheet view. Um, so you can also do that as well, just to check that like, hey, really when you are printing out your data set like that, um, you're really making sure that the column names got loaded up properly. Um, some data sets, when you load them, don't have column names in them. And so you don't want that first row to accidentally be read as like the column name. And so you want to do checks like that. Um, other data sets, and you can see this in the read CSV, sometimes when you get a data set, like the first 10 rows in this data is really just a bunch of text describing what this data set is. And then like the actual data starts on like row 15. So in read CSV, there's like a parameter that you can set for like skip the first 15 rows and then start reading data. Okay, so we should have this TB data set. It is the same exact data set that we have um, from Hadley's paper. And so let's go through um, that process. Okay, we have this data set. I see male 014 all the way to female unknown. Um, it looks like all those columns really should be representing like one set of things. So the first thing would probably be a pivot longer step. So I'm going to take TB and I'm going to pipe this to pivot underscore longer. So this part is really the same thing as before. Um, we're using pivot longer. And then we can say um, right here, M014 colon last call, right? We can do that. Or we can say um, M014 colon, like whatever the last column is. <laughs> so that's one way we can do that. Um, and you can do that as well. I'm just going to show you a different way because uh, we can. So remember all of those other helper functions. There's another helper function that, um, so I, I mentioned contains. There's another one that says starts underscore with. And so this data set is kind of interesting in that all the columns that we want to pivot either begin with M or F, right? Like country and year, we don't care about, and it doesn't begin with M or F. So uh, when people talk about like data science and data processing being like an art, it really is like, this is sort of where like, I think it's easier if I just specify M and F um, versus like starting here and ending there, right? So there's multiple ways you can do something and that's sort of where that art, um, piece comes in. I want to show you this way because we're not just trying to filter or select the columns that start with only one thing like M, it's two things, right? So in R, how do we pass in like multiple things? Like think of it as a, le uh, as a list or it's really a vector. So there's a difference between M as a single entity and M and F as two entities, but it's one package. So in R, if we're trying to submit something that's one package, but there's multiple things in it, we use the C function for combine. And in here, we can specify M comma F. And you can use single quotes or double quotes. This part doesn't really matter. So what this is doing is I'm pivoting longer. This starts with function is saying, I want to select columns that start with some kind of pattern. The patterns I'm giving you, there's multiple patterns. I'm not trying to pull out a single pattern, so I have to use that C. And then in there, I can specify starts with M or starts with F. So now if I run this, it did the same thing as the previous example, um, except this time it's on a different data set. Um, and we're using the starts with instead of the M014 colon notation, right? So either one works. Uh, I just want to show you a different way because we can. Okay, so the next problem, we're almost there. Um, all we need to do is split down the name column into by the first character, right? Um, you can either... Uh, split by like if I if I was manual if it was me personally manually curating this data set I would have put in my column names like M underscore zero dash 14 and then 
M underscore 65, right? I would put underscores because that's what my eyes see. Um, so in this particular data set, we don't have like any special character, but the other heuristic that we can use is split on that first character down the line, right? So in tidyr, there is a function and it's really useful. It's called separate. What separate does is you give it a column you want to split things into or separate by. So the column, so notice that I'm still piping this in. So I still have this original data frame and it's going into the separate function. I'm gonna pass in the name column. And when I do this separate, what do I want to separate into? I want to separate based off of that first split, right? So I can say separate first character. Um, if it was an underscore, I would say separate and I would pass in, in quotes an underscore, right? So when you're manually curating data sets, it's okay if it's not in tidy format. And remember that point I made yesterday, like data isn't really messy if you can plan for it. So leave yourself breadcrumbs if you, if you know you're purposely not putting together a tidy data set because it's much easier for you to enter data or visually inspect data if you're out in the field just leave yourself breadcrumbs so you can perform these operations. And knowing that these operations exist will really help you curate your own data set because you know how to process it. So once we do that split by the first character, it's gonna create two columns, right? It's gonna create like something that contains all the M and F and something that contains all the other numbers. So we're gonna separate into, so that's the parameter that this works in. Remember, we, so now we're gonna separate, because we split by the first character, it's gonna create two things. Uh, so we have to create a single container that holds those two new columns. So it's going to be into, what is that first column? So we'll copy the exact paper. One is columns can call, be called a, uh, be called sex. And the other column is going to be called age underscore group. And now if we run this, bum, bum, bum. We still have that pivot longer step. And then because of separate, it took that name column, broke it down by that first thing, and then created those two columns called sex and age group. Uh, this is probably something really common. Yeah, like I mentioned, like if you download data from the CDC, it all comes in like this kind of weird format, um, especially by like sex and age group. Like they're all like combined together. I have no idea why, but a lot of health data sets come in this format. And so you can do a lot of data processing just with that pivot and separate function. Um, for example, if you're working with telephone numbers, like you can separate on the dash if you format, if you have a form that forces people to put in um, dashes for their phone and you can split out like area code with the rest of the number um, and stuff like that. Okay, last piece of uh, data processing that you might see are variables being stored in both rows and columns. Um, so sometimes you might end up with a data set where data is just stored kind of like everywhere. This is a type of problem you don't really notice right away. But if we look at this data set, it's got the same type of problem that we've been seeing, right? So this is, I don't exactly know where it came from, but it's on um, temperature readings at a particular location um, over a particular day. So you see the D1, it's gonna go all the way to D31. So that is like your signal, like, hey, those are days. Um, if I wanted a quote unquote tidy version of this, I would have to do that same thing that we've been doing, that pivot longer step, right? Um, so there are times when you are processing data that you don't know, you'll just fix the problem that you see right now and then you see what other problems might occur. So right now in my data set, I just want an ID column, a year column, a month column, an element column, and a day column with like a reading or a value column, right? That's when I first look at this data set, I see that there are a bunch of days. Let's fix that part first. Okay, so let's work on, um, oh, okay, actually, no. I need, to, I need to actually go to the next example. So on the left-hand side, um, Yeah, okay. So on the left hand side, they did some other process and they combined all the dates. So that D1 is now uh, like some year month with the actual date. 
Um, so think of it as they did that molten step. If you ever see a data set where for a particular row, there are a bunch of things that are being duplicated. So for example, ID and date are like identifiers and the identifier is being duplicated. And then the only difference is because this other temperature reading is mass and min with the value. That's how you know data was stored in the wrong direction, right? And so what we do now, this is the actual pivot table step in Excel of what Excel is doing. So we actually have to go pivot the values from element. So each unique value of element, so T max and T min, those become their own separate columns. And then how do we know what values to populate? Well, we pick the value column. So to go from that molten data, so that long version of data, so that, that's an older terminology because this paper's from 2014. So that long data to that wide data. So everything we've been talking about was going from wide to long, right? So how do we do it the opposite way from long to wide? We have to actually pick two columns. The column that we want to pivot out, and then another column supplies the values that's getting filled in, right? So if you ever ran the pivot function in Excel, you realize that like, yeah, you have to pick the columns that's getting split on one of the two axes. And then you pick another column that you drag into the thing that's like, this is a thing that's either being averaged or you're just counting or something, right? So you have to pick at least two columns in this wide to long, sorry, long to wide pivot. And again, the, the only kind of like data smell here is if you see identifiers and, that, and they're just being duplicated. Um, this is something that you might have to think about. And so let's go through that example with the third data set. Um, this is a data set that, so, so far all the data sets that we've been using were either coming from Peter Higgins or from Hadley's paper. Um, I went to the um, CMS database, so that is the Medicaid, Medicare. Medicare util Medicaid, um, <laughs> Medicaid data set, and I sort of put together a training data set for us. So we are using CMS data. So we're going to save this to CMS. Read underscore CSV. This is going to be under data slash CMS utilization is the name of the data set. CMS underscore UTI. If I were you, I would simply hit the tab key. Uh, again, my computer is like somewhat freaking out. <laughs> so. so this is CMS utilization data that I have put together. And this is data that roughly has the same type of issues. Um, if we look at just CMS, and I should type that. Um, we have state, the FIPS code, the variable, some set of age group, um, number of chronic conditions, and then a year, and then I believe this is like how much money was spent um, for that particular variable. So you'll notice that this column has that problem that I've been talking about. If we look at the column name, there, there are a bunch of years. This, a lot of data comes out this way because again, it's really easy to input data that way, not really useful. Um, if you're trying to work with it from a programming environment. So we have that first problem we want to fix. It's pivot longer. So let's first deal with that problem. CMS pipes into pivot underscore longer. Um, I'm going to do, I don't know, say, let's say we're going from 2007 and I'm going to use that last underscore call notation. Um, there's probably a way to specify like just pick all the columns that are numbers. Um, there's probably a way you can do it that way. And then I'm going to give it some useful set of names. So remember I'm going to say names underscore two and I'm going to give it year. You can also pass in values underscore two and give it like a dollar amount if you want. But um, just to make the code a little bit shorter, we can do it this way. So now we got something that's useful. Um, we have state, FIPS code, we have a variable called variable, um, sex, age group. I think if I save this to CMS underscore long, 
I'll save this as CMS underscore long, mainly so I can uh, show it to you in a nicer, prettier format. Because one of the columns is actually like I need to be able to read it <laughs> uh, for, for the example to make sense. So if we look at the variable column in this data set, um, so let's look at that first row. For Alabama, Alabama has a, stips, a state FIPS code of 01. There's a variable for per capita spending, actual, for males in the age group less than 65 with zero to one chronic conditions in the year 2008 has a per capita annual spending of 1,639, right? If we scroll down this data set, I'm just gonna scroll down all the way to the bottom. Um, it's not going to be Alabama, but um, mainly it's to look at this variable column. Um, it's gonna be the same set of other things. So it's gonna imagine it says like Alabama 01. Um, it's gonna say hospital readmissions percentage. And then it's gonna give us sex, age group, number of chronic, year, and then a value, right? So. This is one of the things like maybe this makes sense to keep data in this format, but for me, it might be useful if I had state, sex, age group, number of chronic conditions, year, and then like per capita spending as one column, hospital readmissions as another column, right? So if you end up in a situation, especially like a lot of these government data sets, like everything's just in one giant thing, um, you might have to be like, hey, I want this variable column pivoted out. So I want all the unique values as separate values. Uh, this is super common in every single government data set because they end up doing like, they'll do something like males and then count and then females and then count and then like total count. And it's like, why did you put that in there? I could have just summed it up myself. Now I have a column that if I sum, I can't even rely on that number because it's literally double counting everything. So. Government data sets are notorious for this, um, and that's probably the column you pivot out and you just throw away the total column, that total thing, or you double check, like, did they actually sum things correctly? Um, so that's one thing that you might end up doing. So let's pivot wider that one uh, column. So if we go back to this data set, what are the two columns that we need? We're gonna use a variable column to pivot longer and then the value column is what's going to be used to fill in those values. So we can um, take the CMS long data. I'm going to pipe that into pivot underscore wider. So the name of that function to go from long to wide is pivot wider. Um, they used to be called something else that was more confusing. So. It's actually nicer that the folks at our studio are mindful of, of terminology consistency and they just changed everything within the last couple of years. So pivot wider takes in a data frame first as the first parameter, so that's why there's a pipe here. And then we specify those two columns. There's a parameter called names from, so where are you getting the new column names from? We're getting that in this particular data set in the column called variable. And then where, when that pivot happens, where are the values coming from? So there's a parameter called values from, and we're getting that from a column called value. And now if we look at this data set, and you can choose to save this if you want, you get for every state, FIPS code, gender, age group, number of chronic conditions, year, you'll get a separate column for per capita spending, a separate column for uh, standardized per capita spending, ED visits per 1,000 beneficiaries, and then hospital readmissions percentage, right? So you have that data sort of like if you read across the row, remember that last point where, uh, where it's really the second point, um, each row represents a single observation, right? So that observation, what is the unit of observation we're interested in is for the state, gender, number of chronic conditions by year. That is our unit of observation. So when we clean up this data set, it is a nice, we get all the other numbers that are relevant. And now we can do something like, okay, group by each year, give me the, uh, average hospital readmissions percentage, right? Now we can go back to all this stuff we did with those descriptive statistics and do those calculations. 
Um, if you know you're gonna end up doing like all of these column as like averages anyway, maybe you wouldn't do this pivot wider. You'll just group by variable and then summarize mean on value to do all of those calculations. You can do that as well. Um, that's the main point I want to get at, that now that you know how to pivot your data from one format to the other, it's totally okay to be like, I really don't want to write summarize mean four times. Let me just make everything long, pick one column, do the calculation once, and then I can pivot it back if I need to. Um, okay, so that was pretty long. Let us take a break. Uh, we'll take 10 minutes. Um, what time is it now? It is 23, so come back at 33 past the hour. Uh, we'll take a 10 minute break for that. And if you have any questions, just let me know. But um, take a break, go get water. <laughs> Okay, um, we should be back from break. Um, one thing before I go off to the next section, uh, two things. If you don't have, if you try to library the medical data package and you don't have it, please run this command that I put at the bottom here. I will comment it out because I don't actually want it to run. Um, if you end up getting an error that says remotes package like does not exist or what is the actual there is no package called remotes then you actually need to install the remotes package first using install that packages and then run the install github package um, essentially not every single package comes from cran which is where all of the our packages are uh, are stored. So when you run install dot packages something, it's coming from CRAN. Some people because they didn't publish it up to CRAN or CRAN is being CRAN and blocking your package. Um, a lot of packages get in, put onto GitHub, and so you can install packages that aren't on CRAN using that set. And essentially, you pass in their GitHub username and then the actual repository name that they have, and then R can install that package. Um, directly. So if you haven't done so, um, do that. The other question I got um, from someone on break was in the TB data. When we ran pivot longer um, and separate, if you actually look at the help files for pivot longer, there's going to be uh, a couple of parameters that literally do what I did for separate. So hopefully this will figure it out. Yeah, so if we scroll down here a little bit, there's going to be Is it values too? Names repair, names transform. Yeah, so there's a few parameters in the pivot longer that says like name separate. Um, and it says like, it's really the same thing as the separate function. So yes, in theory, you can do this, everything that I did in separate all in one call into pivot longer. Uh, that's actually how common names, two variables being stored in the same column uh, end up being that they put it all into one. I just ended up showing it as two separate steps because it's easier to explain it as two separate steps than in one giant function call. It is literally the same thing. Uh, pivot longer will actually just call separate under the hood for you automatically. So I just also for teaching purposes, it's easier to explain it as two separate steps instead of building this one complicated call. So there is no difference between how those two operate. Uh, in my head, one seems easier than the other. <laughs> um, so I will leave the two commands on the bottom as I sort of just show the next slide deck. It's really just really short uh, before we go into plotting. So 
This part, for the next 45 minutes or so, will cover a, the basics of plotting. When we're plotting data, um, this again comes from Alison Hoard. Um, we need to know what type of information is stored into that column, right? So we saw a little bit of that where like that day column was processed as a character, so it wasn't being processed as a number. Um, so there is a difference between nominal uh, things. So these are unordered descriptions. So you can think of it as like, there is no order for gender. So if you have a gender column, it is a nominal data set. There are ordinal things. So if you're working on Likert scales or Likert scales, um, one to seven has a particular order to it. So you have to treat that a little bit differently. And then a specific type of ordinal data um, or nominal data is binary. So any question that you can ask yes or no. And this becomes really common in medical data sets because most of the time they're really just asking, did this person get cancer, yes or no? Did this person die from treatment, yes or no? Um, so a lot, when I took, um, so I have a master's in public health and epidemiology, really the first stats class that we, the first like stats class on its own that we took was literally just on logistic regression, dealing with binary variables, because that's how common it is in the health world. Um, even if you have something that's on a scale, people will end up turning it into a binary variable and then doing logistic regression on that. So that's what we'll do in the hour after uh, plotting, um, but we'll just show plotting because usually you wanna get a sense of what your data looks like before you start fitting models and stuff and visualization is part of that step. The plotting library that we're going to be using is called ggplot2. Uh, ggplot1 was part of Hadley Wickham's dissertation project. It was, if you talk to him now, ggplot2 would not exist and we would all be using ggplot1 because that pipe operator exists now. It didn't at the time, so the that's why if you see in R code, all of a sudden, instead of the pipe operator, you see the plus operator. That's because ggplot2 was developed and got really popular before all of tidyverse and that pipe operator. So that's sort of why um, when I start doing plots, I don't pipe into ggplot because I will always, it's like a mental switch for me, like I am now plotting. I don't use percent greater than percent, I use plus. Um, but you'll also see people like do all their data processing and then, then pipe into the plotting code and then uh, all of a sudden the, the symbol on the right hand side goes from percent greater percent to pluses and sometimes people forget. So that's some of the history behind ggplot. The way ggplot works is essentially a layering system. So we look from the bottom and we layer things on top. So the first thing we specify is what is the data that we want to plot? So um, the first thing in the ggplot function is going to be the data set. So that's why people pipe into ggplot code uh, when I just separate it out entirely. So we give it a data set. So um, it could be that TV data. It could be the um, any of the data sets we've been working on. So we give it a data set. Next is the mapping layer. So this is how ggplot says, um, let's say we're thinking about a scatter plot, right? That takes, let's say age by height, for example. Um, we need some column that represents age on the x-axis. And we need another column that represents height on the y-axis. So the way we tell ggplot what we want on the x-axis, what we want on the y-axis, what we want as separate colors, all of those things that rely on the data itself is in that mapping layer. That's different from saying like, I want all of the points to be blue. That has nothing to do with the actual data set, right? So mapping stands for what components of my data do I want associated with the figure. For the most part, the statistics and scales layer, you'll keep as the default. You won't really use them too much. But for example, if you have a data set and you want to create a bar graph, usually bar graphs count something. So the statistic for that is going to be count. Um, if you already pre-populated all of the counts already, because in summarize, there's like a count function, um, you can say the statistic is, in ggplot is called identity, which means just like, just plot the number I give you. Don't try to count or do anything with it. So you usually don't, 
really use that statistics layer unless you're using with bar plots that you already pre-calculated. Uh, same with scales. Um, you can put scales later on, for example, if you want something to be on like a logarithmic scale, you can plot the data you have and then add a logarithmic scale on top. You don't have to log transform everything before you plot. So up until then, I haven't talked about like what we're plotting. So usually what you'll see next is um, people spe specify a mapping. They don't really specify statistics or scales. They go straight to the geometry. The geometry is what specifies what the type of plot you're using. So in ggplot, all of the geometries begin with geom underscore. So G-E-O-M underscore. And then it's like geom underscore point for scatter plot. Geom underscore bar for bar graph. Um, geom underscore box plot for a box plot. And how does it know what goes into the x and y axis for all of those figures? It's because you specified it in that mapping layer. So it's if you don't specify on a higher level, it'll just pull from the bottom underlying layer. So think of it as like a pyramid hierarchy of how this all goes. So once you have your figure, let's say it's a scatter plot, another layer, so you're essentially done with your figure. Uh, what's really cool about ggplot2, and this is sort of the reason why, even though I can program in Python, if I know I'm going to draw a plot, I will dump out my data and do all my figure drawing in, in R. Um, things I've gotten a little bit better on the Python side, but it's because of this faceting layer. So I talked to you a little bit about uh, group by operations where we can split up based off of something, do a calculation and put it all back. Faceting is group by, but for figures. So let's say I make a, um, a figure that is um, age and height for everyone in this room, but I also have a variable for gender I can put gender as a faceting variable and all of a sudden I'll get two or n number of genders for each scatter plot. So you don't have to split up your plot anymore as long as you have a column that you know this is how you want your figures split up by, you can, you can facet by that variable. And we'll show you that and it's sort of like the reason why I stick with ggplot2 for everything. Um, next is coordinates. This is something you usually don't really work with. Um, if you like, I think a coordinate layer is like polar. So if you want like those spider plots where like it's essentially like a circle you can change from like euclidean coordinates to circular polar coordinates you can do that i believe technically a map might be considered a coordinate layer so you can you can use ggplot2 to plot maps um i think that's where that coordinate layer is although i think if you give ggplot like map information it automatically knows so you also don't really touch coordinates that often and the last layer on top is theme. So like once you're done with your plot, all of this stuff like title, size of the title, subtitle, if you want X ticks, if you don't want X ticks, if you want major, minor grid lines, if you don't want any of that, if you have like Virginia Tech has their own color scheme and you have to use like that particular hex code for things, um, all of that gets specified in theme. So anything that's not just a plot, um, you can specify as a theme. And this is how a ggplot works, it's all of that layering system. Okay, so let us go and work on some plots. I am going to create a new file, if the computer behaves. Actually click it, yes, okay. So if I was everyone, I would go to session and hit restart R and then also clear the working space. Don't do what I'm doing, which is clicking this little broom thing. Um, and for me, that's mainly because I don't want tidyverse to, to load again. <laughs> um, so a few things that I'm going to do when we're starting about plotting. I'm going to load up tidyverse because we're, we might end up um, loading up some data sets or cleaning data. Um, I don't actually think we do in this case, but it doesn't hurt to load it. Hmm. We're also going to load up ggplot2. I, I'm not sure if tidyverse automatically loads this up for you, but it's also good to be explicit. 
And instead of loading CSVs or Excel files, there is a library called Medical Data. This comes from Peter Higgins in University of Michigan. Uh, and so we're going to use one of his um, blood storage data sets. Um, so once we load up medical data, there is a data set that we can use called blood storage. So if we type in blood underscore storage, we now should get a blood storage data set for us. For me, uh, because I don't want to type blood underscore storage, I am going to say blood gets blood storage, and then we can uh, just work with typing blood instead of blood underscore storage. Um, give me one second. Close out of that. That's done. I might still need that. Yeah, so one of the people, and you also saw, saw it when I loaded up medical data. Um, so R also does this weird thing where like some text shows up as red when it's not really an error. Um, and so this is really just saying that um, this phrase, this word, this function name um, also exists in data set. And because we loaded up medical data, if you're using this function, like be careful because it's now it might not be what you think. And there's a way to get around that issue, but that's sort of why it shows up as red. So even things that are warnings, not errors, show up as red in R. And I wish they didn't do that because that's kind of scary for everyone involved. One other thing you'll notice that if we look at, uh, if we just run blood um, in our console, um, the data set gets printed out a little bit differently. Um, so remember, if we when we were loading things in tidyverse, first it will tell us it's a tibble, then it told us the number of rows and columns, and then for each column underneath, it told us a data type, and then it didn't dump everything out for us. Um, that's because that's the tidyverse way of sh loading up data. Um, in this particular data set, this is how regular base R loads up data. So instead of read underscore CSV, it's read period PS, uh, CSV. Um, and this just gives you everything in one go, which is, it might be nice. I mean, not everything, uh, but it gives you all of the columns that would fit. So that's sort of right why it just ran off the screen. Um, kind of useful depending on where you're coming from, but uh, it sort of just dumps all of the uh, data to the screen. So a little bit about this data set. I am going to read off of the actual documentation for this data set because I don't actually remember this off the top of my head every time. So this is a retrospective cohort study of, 100, of, of 316 men who have undergone radical prostatectomy and received transfusion during or within 30 days of the surgical procedure and had available PSA follow-up data. So the outcome of interest was the time to biochemical cancer reoccurrence. So there is a column in there that is binary, whether or not you had cancer recurrence. Uh, the study evaluated the association between red blood cell storage during uh, duration and biochemical prostate cancer recurrence after the radical prostatectomy. Specifically, one of the tests for this uh, study was that uh, preoperative, preoperative transfusion of allogenic red blood cells stored for a prolonged period is associated with earlier biochemical reoccurrence for prostate cancer after prostatectomy. So there's a few variables in here that are of interest. We know if we find the column that represents like whether or not the person got uh, cancer, that is going to be a variable of, out, of, of interest. Uh, this all plays into account when we're thinking about running the analysis. So we wanna look at what is in this uh, data set before we start running statistics on everything. So that's a little bit of the background of this data set. Um, It seems like everyone has this data set um, up and ready, so we can sort of get started uh, with the visualization aspects. Uh, one thing you can do, remember yesterday when I told you class of something? If we look at class of our blood uh, data set right now, 
yesterday and everything that we looked at, it said data frame on the right hand side and it had a whole bunch of other stuff like tibble, TBL, and then something else. Um, this is a regular plain old data frame. So this is a base R, not tidy verse, uh, plain data frame. Um, if you use the regular ways of loading up data, this is what you get, or this is how it um, behaves. Um, for me right now, I'm going to call this 05 uh, plot. So I'm going to save this. One other thing that's really useful when you get a data set, there's a function called names. And if you pass in the data frame into the function called names, it will give you all of the column names of your data set. Um, this is really useful because if you end up in a situation where you're trying to put in like, for example, age, and it keeps saying like the age column doesn't exist. Um, that's when you look up the names of your data set because chances are there's, there's spaces in here that you can't see because it spaces don't show up. But because of names, everything is in double quotes. If you see a space there, then you have, then you know, like someone put a space um, in the beginning or after the uh, column name. So that ends up being a really useful tool as well. So we talked a little bit about uh, data types. So there's like nominal ordinal binary. So we talked about that. There's also continuous data. So uh, some things are going to be like have decimal values in them. Um, others uh, don't. And okay. All right. So looking at this data set, um, the variable of interest is the recurrence column. So that's going to tell us whether or not someone um, had a recurrence of, of cancer. So that's the column that we're interested in. So let's look at some of the descriptive statistics for this column. One thing, if you know that this is a binary column or really in any variable that you're working with, especially the variable of, of interest, you want to get a sense of how many people are in that group, right? So we can say blood. We can pipe this into group by because we're just going to count for each value of reoccurrence. We want a count of it. So we can say group by, group by recurrence. And then we want to run summarize. Uh, we can say count is equal to sort of like there's a function called n that counts the number of observations uh, you might have to be careful using n because if you have i don't i don't remember off the top of my head if n also counts um missing values um, it's literally counting the number of rows that happen in that data set so if i split up my data set by reoccurrence how many rows are in each group, right? So if you have missing count, my the n will also count the, the missing. So that's something you have to be careful of. Um, there's also another function called count that you can probably drop missing, but I don't think that's a problem in this data set. So if we look at our data set, we have reoccurrence zero typically stands for no, and one typically stands for yes. So in our data set uh, of all of the patients, 262 do not have reoccurrence, 54 do. The first thing you keep in mind when you end up with data sets like this, um, clearly one, there's a class imbalance, that's the actual statistical term. There's a group with a lot and a group with a little. And if we think of statistics as a way of, think of it this way. If we fit a model and all this model did was just tell you no, regardless of what input it was, it would do 262 out of the 313, like that proportion, that is like how well it did, right? Even if it just, it just gave you zero, right? Um, so that's the danger when you have a class imbalance is that problem is like the number that you get from your statistics, like all, all of the evaluation metrics that you do for this statistical model is going to be really inflated because all it could be doing is just guessing zero. Right. So another thing that can happen is um, 
some of your inboxes might get flooded with a bunch of spam and you get like very few useful emails, but a bunch like disproportionately amount of spam. If I wrote a classification model that just threw everything into spam, yeah, you might not be happy, but on its own, it did like 99% well because you get 99% like spam email, right? So, or vice versa, you have like a personal email that you never use to, to register for anything. Um, if I just let everything through, including the spam emails, I probably did 99% well, which is fine, but you're not happy because it wasn't really doing its job, right? So that is the first thing you want to look at if you end up with a data set is look at if you have class imbalance. There's many ways to get around this. Uh, one way would be, okay, so I'm not gonna use all 262 of that value, I'm just gonna use 54. So now my class is balanced, run your statistical model, and then you resample and rerun that model a bunch of times using different sets of 54 uh, for the other class, right? So that's a very simplified way of how you can handle it. Um, but you definitely do not want to throw all your data into one go because your model is going to act better than it actually is. And that's more important in the healthcare world because usually that is someone's life, right? So you want to be very careful of, you might as well have a model that's underperforming and know why than like a model that seems really good and like it goes into production and then all of a sudden like, well, like we're still having all these people like having issues and we don't know why. Okay, so let's go and actually um, plot this data, right? So I showed you the visual count for this. Um, so let's actually use ggplot to look at this data. So we already loaded up ggplot. So the first thing I'm going to do is ggplot data is equal to blood. So remember that data layer. So I'm gonna say put in that data layer. If I run this, um, Hopefully the screen here is big enough, but you should see literally a gray square or a gray, gray rectangle show up in your in your uh, browser pane in the bottom right corner. I believe my data set, my screen is just too small right now. So yes. It should also like point to it automatically, but my computer is also like doing weird things that I don't understand. So, okay. So in the plots tab, if it doesn't automatically go there, should just throw you a gray uh, rectangle. And that makes sense because all we said was like, here's data. Like we haven't, in reality, if you remember that layering system, we haven't given a geometry yet. So it really doesn't know what to plot. So remember that layering system, the next thing was the uh, mapping. So in ggplot, um, so if your function ends up taking up a bunch of space within a set of round brackets, you can put a new line in there. So I'm going to do that just so things don't run off the side of the screen. So in ggplot, we can specify the mapping layer. This part of the code looks a little bit weird. Uh, mapping takes a function called AES for aesthetic. It's sort of how I kind of wish it didn't do things this way, but it's sort of how um, things work internally. So in mapping, we specify an aesthetic. So mapping equals AES. In here, we specify that mapping layer. So what do we want on the x-axis? What do we want on the y-axis if that applies? So because we're just thinking about using a bar plot there's, and we're going to have it do the count for us, we really only need to specify um, the x-axis layer. So x is equal to recurrence. And now if we run this, again, we get a gray square. Uh, but this time we get some lines in it. Um, again, that's because we haven't put in the uh, geometry layer. Assuming I spelled that correctly. All right. I'm going to assume it's spelled correctly and I, I can talk while that thing loads. So we talked about that data layer, the aesthetic layer. The next thing we want to add is that mapping layer, uh, that geometry layer, layer, so we actually get a plot. So this is sort of where ggplot becomes a little bit weird in terms of its syntax. 
So after ggplot, you're going to say plus. Usually people put a new line after the plus, just like people usually put a new line after that pipe symbol. We're going to add another layer. In this case, we're going to say geom underscore. So remember, all of the geoms are the geometry layers. So if you look at geom and you sort of let your cursor wait a little bit or you hit tab, you can see here these are all of the different types of plots that ggplot can do. Um, so you can make density plots, 2D density plots. Um, you can add error bars to things, um, et cetera, et cetera. So those are all geometry layers. The one that we are interested in is called geom underscore bar to make a bar graph. And so if we run that, now that it knows what type of plot we make that we want, it's going to say, okay, I'm going to draw a bar graph using the blood data set. And on the x-axis, I'm going to use recurrence. And because it's a bar graph, by default, that statistic is going to be count. So it's going to, it should draw a bar graph with those two uh, counts for us. Uh, sure, it'll take a while. I don't know why. Uh, while that's thinking, um, I'm going to take this uh, code that we wrote before um, that did that count for us, and I'm going to save that into a variable. So that table, um, maybe it's something that um, you want to write out so someone else on your team in a shared drive just always gets updated counts as a study is going. So we can say, we can save this to recurrence underscore freak for recurrence frequency and then hopefully that'll save the data set for recurrence frequency that we can use later on there we go that makes me really worry about some of the plots we're going to draw <laughs> um, okay so this what it did was because it's manually doing that calculation of frequency under the hood it sort of took a little bit um, but that's how we created a bar graph we specified here's the variable you i want you to count and go ahead and count it and ggplot is roughly smart enough to know like hey i'll put the column that you specified on the bottom that's something you can fix in theme if you want to and then count for a bar plot that's probably what you want so it, it gave us that as a label as well so we can also do the same thing. Um, so I'm going to copy. Do I want to copy that? No. What is in this recurrence freak? OK. So I'm going to copy the previous code again. And I'm going to paste it. And I am going to, instead of putting blood, we are going to use recurrence frequency. And for the X, we are going to put in recurrence, which is fine. And then now, because we're using something that's pre-calculated, we want to actually manually specify the Y, right? So in AES, we can say Y is equal to count, right? And this is because we've pre-calculated everything. So now in this example, when we run a geom bar, instead of running count, we now have to specify the statistic is now identity, right? So instead of just doing the counts, hopefully this is much faster because it's not actually doing the counts. It's literally just saying um, plot here with this number and plot that with that number. Yeah, and so it's much faster because it's not doing that calculation under the hood anymore. Okay, so that's with um, the actual uh, bar graph. Um, if you go to the actual materials, like I show you that like some of the order in here, like data and mapping, you can put data and mapping into the into geom bar as well. Um, why you would want data in different parts is you can actually use data to plot one plot and then use data from another plot to superimpose on top so you can have multiple data layers. So remember, it's a layering system. If you don't specify something in one layer, it just pulls from the layer below. So if you actually specify a different data set, you can actually use plot two different data sources. 
Um, so you don't always have to combine all your data into one go. If you, that's uh, for plotting, um, you can literally pull in two different data sources, um, which is kind of cool. Um, you'll know when you actually need to use it. Um, I can't off the top of my head remember the last time I've had to, but I know I've done it before. So, okay, let's talk about some other plots. So one, one of the plots in here is maybe we think age plays a factor into our data set, right? Um, age is a continuous variable, so we don't really need bar plots for age. So typically stuff like age gets plotted in a histogram. Yes. Oh, so the question is, what is the difference between this figure and the one we just made? There is should be no difference between this figure. And, um, the only difference is in the code because right now, instead of using the original blood data set, I saved that summary count and we're plotting the predetermined counts. And so that's why the code is different. Uh, before it was just recurrence using the count statistic, but now we're just saying, I've pre-calculated everything for you. Use recurrence for X, use the count value I made for Y, and don't actually tally anything, just plot the numbers I gave you. Um, so that's the actual difference. It's in code and it should not show up in the actual figure. Um, so another thing, so we're just gonna play around with the different types of geometries at this point. Um, so another geometry, so we can say ggplot, this might take a while, so I'm just gonna type things out. Uh, blood, we're gonna put in uh, the blood data set. You don't always have to say mapping equals, and most of the time you won't even see that in other people's code uh, because it's understood. Uh, the function already knows the second parameter is the mapping. So you'll see uh, instead of data equals, it'll just be blood comma AES or data frame comma AES. So um, if you want to be super like explicit, you can write it this way. And sometimes for some people, writing all of the parameters out that way help with just figuring out what this function is doing. But when you look online, you'll just see code written like data frame or the data set comma AES, and that's sort of why it is. So we can say plot age on the x-axis, and then we're going to add a geometry. So it's geom underscore histogram. And that will plot a histogram for age. Um, the thing that's going to happen here, you might end up with some text on the bottom that will say something like stat bin using, uh, using 30, pick a better uh, value with bin width. So essentially what it's saying is whenever GG, ggplot will try its best to make a histogram, but it's only ever going to max out at 30 bins because that's sort of like a reasonable upper limit for things. Um, you can overwrite it. So let's say you want 50 bins. It's telling you right here, you can set bins equal to something if you want to change the number of bins, right? So sometimes looking at 30 bins, like more bins is not very useful in terms of figuring out the actual distribution of things. So if you ever forget down here, we can say in geom histogram, bins is equal to, for example, 10, and it'll draw a histogram with 10 bins. So each of those geoms have their own different ways on how you can tweak it, right? So in histogram, it makes sense to have bin width. In geom bar, it makes sense to have like a different statistic. Um, so you can always look at the help pages uh, for geom uh, whatever um, to help you around. Yep. It's 10 bins, not, it's not the width. Um, I, there might be an actual parameter for like bin width um, but yeah, this is just number of bins. Okay, so that's all stuff we can do with um, some examples of stuff with one variable. So let's look with um, plots that take two variables. So everything's gonna end up starting with ggplot because we have to specify that base layer. So we're gonna start with uh, ggplot uh, using the base layer. What's also kind of cool is that AES stuff doesn't have to be in that ggplot layer. So like layers are somewhat interchangeable. Um, so you can put AES here. Um, I typically do, but sometimes you won't, especially if you're trying to superimpose different uh, figures on, the, uh, on top of one another. So you can say geom, so let's say we use boxplot. 
in the box plot, we can actually put in the aesthetic layer in there, right? So that's one of the weird things in ggplot. Um, some of the component, like you can have a completely empty ggplot layer and then put the data and the mapping in the geom layer as well. So some people will have different preferences on how they put things up. I'm just going to show you what you might see in the wild. Um, usually I write code like this. I put in my data set, I put it, I tell it already like what columns I want, and then I specify the actual plot I want. Um, you might, for some needs, you might, it, yeah, it's sort of like personal preference slash like what is exactly happening. So I'll just show it to you this way. So uh, one of the two variables um, that might be of interest, there is a column in here called tval, which represents the tumor volume as an ordinal variable. So you either have one, two, or three for low, medium, or excessive. So that's the tval. So in a box plot, we might want a, um, let's check at like, the tumor volume with age, right? So we want a separate box for each different type of tumor volume, and then let's see how the age distribution changes between that, right? So we're gonna say on the X, we want a separate bar plot, uh, a separate um, box plot. So for the X, we're gonna say tval, and then for the Y, we can say now we want in our uh, box plot, uh, that Y we want as age. So it's going to throw us an error that's on purpose, and the figure is going to look weird, and that's on purpose. Um, what you should see is really one tumor uh, value, and then the age di distribution, I think, for like everyone in our data set. And then you get this warning message about um, there's some missing value, so we got rid of it, but um, it realized that we might be doing something weird. And we can see it did something weird because we expected three separate box plots for each one of those types, like type one of, in tumor volume of one, two, or three. And that's because if we really look at our data set, tval got read in as a number, like a continuous number. It's not being read in as a discrete category. One of the nice things with R that I like in some of the other programming language, like I know Python does this, SAS doesn't really like this, Stata I don't think likes this either. Um, if you ever work with a statistician, sometimes they just say like, give me the data set, and if it's, for example, like you get a value like tumor volume, like they only want it, everything as numbers, right? Like give me a code book, and then give me a data set where the entire data set is nothing but numbers, right? Sometimes um, your statistician might want that. Part of it is because it's sort of like they just don't want to clean any of their data, of your data. They just want to run the stats and give it back to you. They don't want to process anything. So they make you process everything. What's nice about um, in R, instead of in our data set, instead of having one, two, and three, we could have actually just in the data set have low, medium, excessive. In some way, I prefer it that way because your code book now travels with your data. You never have the situation where like, here's the data set, I have no idea what one, two, and three means, um, but now it doesn't matter if it's one, two, or three, it's li literally written low, medium, or excessive. And that's why I keep looking here because I have to remember uh, what those numbers are, right? Uh, so that's sort of the problem in this current data set. We need to convert this continuous variable that's being read as something that's discrete. How do we do that? I showed you before, we can convert types using as dot something. So before we converted character to number using as dot numeric. In the R world, a categorical variable is called a factor. So if we want to convert something into a categorical variable, we can use as dot factor. So we don't even need to pre-process, we don't even need to change that using mutate or anything. In the AES call, we can literally say as dot factor which will convert this data set or convert that column into a factor variable all in, um, in one go. So you can process your data, treat it as a numeric, and then you can convert it later on. And then because now it knows that's a categorical variable because it is a factor, it knows to draw separate box plots. And we also have a category for unknown tumor volume. So now we have age for 
uh, different things like that. One thing that um, I personally like, um, anytime I draw a box plot, um, maybe if you've been looking at these for your entire life, you can tell which one of these is skewed in which way. Maybe some of the um, outlier points will help you. I personally, anytime I draw a box plot, there is a plot called violin. Um, so I'm going to run the same exact plot, but I'm going to plot it as a violin plot. And I like violin plots because essentially it draws a histogram and it mirrors it and it really can overemphasize if your data is not is skewed in one way or another. Um, sometimes they're useful, sometimes they're not. Um, but usually when I look at one, I usually plot both. And then the one that I end up presenting is the one that kind of like shows if, it, if, if everything is relatively normal, I'll just show the box plot and be like, hey, they're all the same. If I really want to be like, hey, we got to look at one of these variables, um, I would show the violin plot. And I have no idea why it's taking so long, but it will eventually show up. Um, hopefully it showed up on your computer and it looks like a violin. Um, maybe I should, instead of writing the code, show it to you uh, here. Maybe we'll just scroll. Uh, part of it because like we're sort of at time and I kind of just want to like show you the cool plots for it. Um, but all of this stuff is uh, is written here, so I'm not too too worried about it. Oh, don't tell me it like screwed up. All right, all right. So violin plots will look like that. It's called a violin plot because sometimes when it's super skewed, it looks like a violin, like hump and a tail. So. It's a violin plot. Um, this is one example where you can add different layers. So here I drew the violin plot and then I also put a point on top so you can see the actual point. For the points, instead of point, you can also use geom underscore jitter. So it will, it's not gonna be new accurate in terms of where the points are. It'll spread the points out, but it gives you another way where you can add a different layer but then also like see where the points are clustered. So you can use these type of plots just to get a sense of where things are. Um, so other aesthetic mappings um, here. So under AES, hopefully this is big enough. We only talked about X and Y so far, but remember, let's say you have a column that is a categorical variable and you want to use that categorical variable as a color. So AES, you can specify X, Y, you can specify another category for the color and it'll automatically color it for you. You don't have, so that's really the nice thing of, and this is sort of when tidy data principles all come together. Once you have columns separated out this way, you can just be like, oh, I want each point to be a different color. Use this column as that variable. And then the color happens. In this case, um, what is SGS? Uh, Sergio Gleason score. One, two, three, four. So it is a categorical variable. It shows, it treats it as a continuous variable. So we can do that as that factor again, and you can actually get like different colors. So it's not on a scale. So uh, that's sort of the nice thing about um, ggplot2 that I absolutely love is as long as my data set has columns that are properly set up, making these plots is relatively easy compared to any other plotting system that I've dealt with. Um, stuff like the, um, uh, what is this called? The legend name and stuff, that all goes under themes. I'm not really gonna show you too much about themes because of time. But what I do want to show you is, let's say we take that scatter plot we just wrote, right? So we have color is factor um, surgical Gleason score. And now we want to, just like group by, I want a separate scatter plot for each different value of RBC age group because that's one of the factors that we care about in this data set. So we can ruse facet underscore wrap. And what it will do is for each different um, RBC age group, draw that same scatter plot. So we get a totally separate scatter plot for each one of those groups. And that took essentially zero effort because one, our data set is set up that way. It's set up to take in, um, just point to a column and let ggplot do its job, right? And so if we want two variables instead of facet underscore wrap, there's one called facet underscore grid and you can specify two categorical variables and it'll just keep splitting out your data. Uh, 
this is the reason why I fell in love with ggplot2 because uh, if you see here, this was the code for it. Blood, here's my two uh, things I want as my scatter plot. I wanted a color. This is the scatter plot. I want a scatter plot broken up by these two variables. Um, the little notation is the tilde to specify it. Um, there's a technical reason why that tilde exists, so that's shift and then the key to the left of the number one. Um, for me, I would ignore what it actually means um, and just use this as a reference as you um, like start plotting. Um, so, And then there's themes, so you can have a theme and then literally you can add different themes. So there's a minimal theme. Um, there is a library called GG theme. So if you really want, here's the Wall Street Journal theme. Uh, here's the 538 theme. I really get a fun kick out of the old Excel 1993 theme just because it's funny. And it's just like, oh yeah, if you really want someone to think that you did everything in Excel, you can use this Excel theme and then just be like, yeah, I did it in Excel, like whatever. So that's just something that's sort of fun, but you can use themes to make whatever lab colors that you have. Um, if you are working on a paper and you want to standardize things, you can look up, it's a little bit more complicated, but there are a lot of YouTube talks about it, about setting up ggplot themes. You can create your own theme and it doesn't matter what plot you make. At the end, you just say plus my theme and it'll just at least get all the colors and stuff set up. Um, and then because theme is a layer, you can have that base theme. And if you need to find tweak things, you can just add more overriding theme layers on top. So that's the really cool thing about it. OK. Uh, next thing, last slide. Uh, we're going to talk, talk about, about uh, fitting models. And logistic regression is the thing we're going to talk about. Uh, this is the only time you're really going to see math, but hopefully, hopefully I can teach you statistics in 35 minutes. Um, it won't be too bad, I promise. <laughs> um, so we, we're going to work on the same data set, this blood um, data set. We have a general sense of the variables involved. So all of these roles of nor nominal, ordinal, binary, continuous, discrete, they all come into play. In, in this particular data set, our variable of interest, so that's always really important. Given the data set, like which one of these columns represent the thing I care about? Once you figure out the column, then you say, what is in this column? If it's a binary variable, fine, um, because that question will determine whatever model you fit, right? So if it's continuous, that's when you use regular linear regression. Um, you might hear of like machine learning algorithms, like that all, the first decision you have to make is like, what is the column I care about? And then what type of data is in it? And that will help you navigate um, which model you're gonna end up using. So in our case, we're using logistic regression. It is an extension of linear models. So we've all seen like that equation for a line, which is y equals mx plus b, right? Linear models is really y equals m1x1 plus m1x2 plus a bunch of mx's plus b. That is all a linear model is. You might have heard when you look at papers or when you talk to other statisticians and stuff, uh, they care about like, oh, what is that beta value? That beta value is literally that m. So if we think of y equals mx plus b, the beta is really can be written as y equals beta x plus b. Uh, and that b is um, uh, the y-intercept. So like that y-intercept here. So when we think about linear models, so in proper statistics term, once we fit our model, like the actual line we're gonna draw, instead of regular y, it's y hat, meaning that like, this is the y that I've calculated. Um, so that's a little bit of a technical term. But so let's say here in our data set, we care about uh, five variables, age, tumor volume, pre-op, PSA, um, Tumor volume comes into three different pieces. So there's one, two, and three. Um, one of the things to take note when you're trying to put ver uh, values into a model, let's say, uh, I'll just use gender. Should I use gender? I should not use gender. I'll find something else. <laughs> um, let's use handedness, right? Like either you're left-handed or you're right-handed. That seems or you're ambidextrous. 
I'm gonna, if you are, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> you don't exist in this data set. Um, but you might have a column that literally says um, L or H for, for that column, right? Um, what ends up happening is because it's a categorical variable, um, there, what ends up happening is you end up creating something called a dummy variable. So you end up for converting the column that's called handedness, because there's only two variables, it becomes a column that is, are you left-handed, yes or no, or are you right-handed, yes or no, right? Because everything eventually needs to become a number, like in statistics, that's just how it works. So that's why statisticians just like, give me everything in numbers, right? Everything eventually has to have a number. So there is no number for left-handedness or right-handedness. There's only a zero, one, yes, no answer to, are you left-handed or are you right-handed? So we have to convert any categorical uh, column needs to have a separate column for each value of the category, right? So you turn, that's why a PVAL that had one, two, and three has three different columns, whether you're value one, whether you're value two, or whether you're value three, right? So in the data set, if I have a value of three, that row of data will look like zero, zero, one. Right? Because I, I'm a value of three, I'm not going to be uh, two or one. So if I'm right-handed, I'm not going to be left-handed. The way a lot of these linear models work is um, if you're right-handed and I already know, given you're right-handed, you're not left-handed, if there's a one in the right-handed column, it's I already know without looking at anything else, you're a zero on the left hand. That creates a problem called... Uh, multi-collinearity, where like one column literally can define another column. That becomes a problem in a lot of linear models. So we can drop whether or not you're left-handed, or you can pick which one. I'm right-handed, so I'm gonna be biased against the left-handed folks. We can drop the left-handed column, and then all I know is, are you left or are you right-handed zero or one? And if you're a one, then I know you're not left-handed. If you're a zero, then I automatically know you're right-handed. So that's essentially what dummy variables do. In R, once you use the formula notation and once you use as dot factor, it will create that for you. So in SAS, you have to actually manually do all of that. If you've ever worked in SAS before, some of the data step or some of the proc steps in SAS um, will handle it for you. Some don't. But in R, if you use um, the formula notation that I'll show you, we'll handle that for you. So that's linear models. That's great. If the thing that we're counting on is like, let me predict age given your age and height are actually two terrible things. Uh, given, yeah, age and height, that works. Because if you're like eight, you're probably shorter. Okay, so age and height, right? So that makes sense as a linear line that we draw. But what if it's a binary variable, right? Like, did you get cancer, yes or no? If you try to draw a line between two points, zero and one, like, here's zero and here's one, like this straight line, like just looking at it, doesn't seem like a good model for a binary variable, right? So that's where logistic regression comes in. Um, essentially, logistic regression is regular linear regression, but we like put it through a function to make it like this S-shaped curve. And that's important because that S-shaped curve is now only bound between zero and one, right? So now this line better fits the data that we have. And that's all logistic regression is, is a transformation of linear regression. And then the other, and because we transformed it going in, when we interpret it, we have to untransform it coming out. That's all logistic regression is doing. Uh, here's the math for how it works. It doesn't really matter other than saying the actual name of the function that it's transforming to, do, to make it go from a straight line to a squiggly line is called the logit function and it's taking the log of the odds. That's all it's doing. Um, so, and because if you've ever heard of odds before, that is why in logistic regression, things are always interpreted as odds ratios. So if you ever heard of like, what are the odds of someone getting cancer? It is this many times higher. It's because they're using logistic regression and that is part of the untransforming of going from a straight line to a line that is in an S-shaped curve. That is, all that is going on. Um, so even here, you can see like this um, this part, that's regular linear regression. We transform everything and it looks like this. You can see like up here above the E is literally the linear regression portion. 
and to get the odds we take the to get rid of this e part we take the log of it and then we get the odds ratio that's essentially all that's going on so that's why the mutate function comes into play that we learned earlier because we have to take a transformation of that column for us to interpret it so let's see what this looks like um, that is all the statistics you should know uh, I went through all of that mainly just to show you um, why the words are the way they are right that's why we talk about things in odds ratios when we when you, we work with a lot of health data okay so I'm gonna start up a new uh, thing um, all my libraries I'm not even gonna try to reset things at this point because uh, the computer is just gonna die um, I will just type the code here Uh, just for completeness sake, um, but let's go and figure out, um, let's fit this first model. Um, so I talked about logistic re reg regression being a special type of linear model. R, R, what's nice about R is it's a language that was built by statisticians for statisticians, so a lot of these statistical methods are built in off the bat. Um, if you look up more types of machine learning stuff, the folks at our studio, I just realized the camera's off. Uh, the folks at our studio have created another ecosystem like Tidyverse. They call it Tidy Models. I'm not going to teach you Tidy Models because there's a even more, there's more fundamental theory of how machine learning works for me to teach you Tidy Models. Although, if that's what you want, maybe that's part two of this whole series. Um, but there's a lot more that goes into that. So. Because linear models, logistic regression is a special type of linear model, there is a function called GLM that literally stands for a generalized linear model. So what are the two variables? Uh, let's make a, let's build a, a simple variable uh, model first. First, we have to know what is the column of interest. For us in this particular case, it's recurrence. How do we specify the actual like MX plus B part? Like how do we specify all those other variables? We literally have the tilde. So this is the same tilde from ggplot. It means something re really different um, in both sides. But when you're working with models, the tilde essentially is the, the equal sign in the Y part. So like think of recurrence as the Y is equal to, and now we're gonna specify the rest of the MX plus B. So here, we specify what are the variables we care about. Maybe age. So I'm going to say tilde age. Then we have to specify what is the data set we are working with. So I'm working with the blood data. Um, this is because it's carried over from before. And because it is a generalized linear model, we have to specify which linear model we are trying to make. right? So in here, we can specify family is equal to binomial. That is just the R way of specifying logistic regression. Um, if you work with um, count data, so let's say like the variable of interest is count data, you might end up fitting a Poisson regression. So that's where you say family equals to Poisson because it's all just drawing a straight line, doing some transformation, undoing it. Um, if you are doing count data, but you have a bunch of zeros um, because of how data is like, it's because of imbalanced things, that's called like a zero inflated Poisson model, I think that's what it's called. So there's different models for different things. So that's why understanding what is in that variable of interest is so, is so important because it literally will define what models you can and, sh and can and cannot use. So we specified this model. And that's it. Um, all of that fancy stuff you see online about fitting models and doing machine learning, like it really boils down to this one line of code. 90% of your other work is tidying and cleaning data and then figuring out what these numbers mean and then processing code for figuring out what these numbers mean. But in terms of fitting a model, literally it's like one line. Pretty much for almost every model you will fit is probably one line of code, assuming your data is properly formatted. And that is 
why so much effort was put into formatting your data because literally most of your work is, is doing that. Um, doing the actual model fit, probably the easiest part. Um, some people like just fitting models in the very beginning just because they just want to see something, um, but that's fine. Uh, so we can even save this. We can call this mod one and save it to a variable just like every other variable. So how do we actually go and um, interpret this stuff? There's a summary function. So we summarize, run summary on, so this is different from summarize. I know some people before in the past have written summarize because that's what I showed you from tidy first world. It's summary, not summarize. If we pass it in, this is where we get, um, if you hear people talk about a coefficient table or like what are the betas or like what are the results, running summary is what gives that to you. Um, and if you care about like p-values, it, it's all there. <laughs> Uh, hold on, let me, right here. This portion of summary under coefficients, uh, that is your coefficient table. That is, those are your betas, essentially. That is the number that people care about. That is the p-value people care about, et cetera, et cetera. So it would be nice if we had this table as a data frame, because right now it's coming up with a bunch of other stuff. Right. So what's nice about data frames? Well, it's nice because once we have a data frame object, we can say write.csv or write.excel, dump it out to somewhere and um, happy, happy life. Right. So there's another uh, library um, it comes with tidyverse. It's called broom. It's called broom because it's sweeping and cleaning up your model objects. Um, there's a lot of puns in the R world. Um, if you make R libraries, uh, that's try to make something with the letter R in it because you get to capitalize it. That's sort of just how people have fun with uh, things in the R world. In the broom package, there is a function called tidy. And if we give the tidy function pretty much any model object moving forward, um, any, uh, it, a lot of people, this pop, this package has been so popular and so useful to so many people that they've just incorporated any type of model object for most of these things. So once you give the tidy function in broom a model object, essentially it pulls out the coefficient table and gives it back to you as a data frame object. So now you can say like, you can save this to a variable like res1 for result1. And now you can say like write.csv and then dump it out. And then you have a table that maybe you can just copy paste into a paper. Um, but there's one more step. So remember when I said um, there is a function that transform your data to go from straight line to sigmoidal line, and then you have to untransform it back. So we can interpret this value. If this was regular linear regression, we would say for every one unit increase in age, the uh, well, this doesn't make sense because it's binomial. So if this was age and the response was height, it would be for one unit increase in age, the height is predicted to increase by 0 0.01 inches or something, right? If that was regular linear regression, that's how we would interpret that number. In logistic regression, we can't say it that way because we did that weird log odds thing. So the way we would interpret it, if it was just like this, it would be, uh, for every one unit increase in age, the log odds of being going from zero to one, so getting cancer, increases by 0 0.015, right? That's a weird sentence. Like, what the heck is a log odds? That doesn't make sense to you as a person. Um, doesn't make sense to me as a person to interpret that. So instead of saying log odds, we have a general sense of what odds is. And odd, the odds of something happening makes more sense to us as humans than log odds. So we can undo the log part by exponentiating. So we can say, because this is a regular data frame, we can say res1, because we already loaded up tidyverse, remember that function mutate that I showed you? We can calculate the odds by saying exp, so exp, so exponentiate 
by exponentiating the estimate column. So now we can say, for every one unit increase in age, the odds of getting cancer increases by 0.02 times. And that makes a lot more sense in terms of English, in terms of other people's understanding. Um, there's a technical definition for what an odds is. It's not exactly the probability of something happening, but it's close enough if that helps you just gauge what's going on. So I wrote in the actual like chapter, the prose version of this uh, thing. There's only really one way you can interpret that number. And that sentence I have like written in here, and it's literally what I just said, which is, um, for every one unit increase in age, the odds of going from zero to one in our response increases by zero point, sorry, 1.02 times, right? That is really the only way you can specify that, write that sentence. And that's why the results part of a lot of stats papers or medical papers, it sounds super rigid, because that's really the only way you're allowed to write that sentence. Any other way where you try to make it sound more like English is probably wrong. And that's where people get in trouble trying to interpret p-values and things. Um, the only way you can kind of get away with making it sound like regular English is if you do the Bayesian analysis version of this. That's because Bayesian things have, there's a reason why you can interpret things like that. Chances are in this data set, both results will be the same. Um, but unless you do the Bayesian version of logistic regression, you cannot say that sentence any differently. Um, so that's how we fit a model. Um, so I'm going to scroll up. Actually, you don't have to scroll up. I can just type it. So let's just fit another model, uh, GLM, right? We still have recurrence. We put a tilde. And then how do we add more variables to our data set, um, to our model? We literally put a plus after age. So we have age plus PVOL plus pre-op PSA, for example. So let's use these three variables, right? Um, hold on, is PVOL actually Oh, PVAL is actually in gram, so let's not use that one because that doesn't make sense right now. So we will use PVAL. PVAL. Oh, okay, we did. Hold on. TVAL. T, T, T. We'll use T. Uh, so tumor volume, that was the one that was in categories one, two, and three, right? So we know that we don't want to treat that as a number, one, two, and three. Um, we want to treat this as a categorical variable. Yeah. So we can turn that into a categorical variable by using as.factor. And then the rest of the code is the same for that GLM. So we say data is equal to blood, family, family is equal to binomial. All right, so that's mod two. Um, if you're going through the notes, it's technically mod three, but I'm just skipping that because I'm just showing you this as.factor part. And so everything else is exactly the same as before. So we can look at summary of ma2. Um, and then we can look at uh, tidy using broom of ma2. Summary is nice because if you give this to an actual statistician, all of this other stuff like AIC, um, so this is one way you can, so AIC is one of those numbers that only makes sense in relationship to another model. Um, so if you, for example, were to look at the AIC from mod one and compared it to mod two, I, I hope the one from mod two is lower. Um, someone else, please check me on that. But AIC is one of those numbers where if you're comparing two numbers, the one with the lower AIC is the better model. And it's essentially trying to balance if I just put every single variable into a model, probably it probably do better, but it's trying to penalize, like if it's not being useful, then we won't make, we'll, we'll put a penalty on it. So it's trying to balance what's known as, um, oh God, what is the term? I forgot the term, that's really bad. Um, 
essentially it's trying to balance like the simplicity of the model with like how useful the model is and there's an actual technical term for that um, but we can pass it into tidy of mod 2 remember that we would have to um, mutate this so it's not just mod 2 uh, so we will save this into results 2 or actually um, if we want to do this like more tidy piping way, we can say mod two gets piped into tidy, which gets piped into mutate, and odds is equal to the exp exp of of estimate. Right, so. We can pipe things along, and this is sort of why piping is really useful. We don't have to save intermediates. Um, I'm really hoping that if I just make this bigger, I don't get the scientific notation of things. Um, but you'll notice one thing that happened because we turned tumor volume into a categorical var var variable. It had values of one, two, and three. It automatically dropped one for us, right? Because if it's tumor volume of two, then we know it's not one or three. And if it's not two or three, like both of those are zero, then we automatically know it's value of one, right? So that's why to make the number of variables smaller in our data set, because there are penalties for that, we can automatically drop one of those. Certain functions, certain models require you to do that. So all of these linear types of models require you, require you to do that. Other models that fit more in the machine learning world, they don't care. Just dump it all in and it'll just give you a result back. Um, but, so how do we interpret this set of uh, values? Um, let's look at um, these dummy variables. So this is 8.65. So, and this is 2.39 times 10 to the one. So this is way higher than that. So how do we interpret this number? So age, I already showed you how we can interpret age. The number didn't really change that much. Um, but how do we interpret these things that are like dummy variables? So the way we formulate this sentence is very similar to the one I just said. We say that the odds of, what was that? Oh, I think my screen share just died. That's what happened. Um, okay, so we say that the odds of okay. So which one am I looking at? Um, okay, so let's look at this one down here. The way we can say it is the odds of earlier biochemical recurrence of prostate cancer after prostate So that is our y variable of interest the odds of that increases by 23.9 times when the patient has a tumor volume of three compared to one which is excessive compared to low assuming all else is equal all right so that's how we interpret these numbers um, with categorical variables um, and then for for things like age or other numeric values, it's for every one unit increase. Um, some people, what you'll see is they take standard deviations for all of the numeric values. So instead of one unit increase, like one increase in age, they'll say one standard deviation increase. So you have to be very careful what the actual unit of your column is at this point. So remember that first day we talked about like degrees in Fahrenheit or something. So it'll be like one degree Fahrenheit in increase. Maybe that's your uh, unit. If you take a z-score and you standardize everything, it's no longer degrees Fahrenheit, it's standard deviation changes, right? Some people, depending on who you do work with, they just standard deviation everything because now everything's in terms of standard deviations. And so you typically are just like, if someone's just way off the scale, you just know how much worse they are or how much better they're all. Um, so that unit now plays a very important role in how you interpret these numbers. Um, yeah, so any questions? Uh, that's where I wanted to leave it. Uh, so hopefully, like, fitting a model isn't as scary because it really is like GLM. What is your Y, tilde, and then just Xs with pluses into it? If it's a categorical variable, remember to wrap it around as dot factor. Um, you'll see that for a lot of the base R uh, functions. 
Um, I'm hoping using logistic regression is the most useful right now because that is usually you can get your data set into a question that is yes or no. Um, if it's not logistic regression instead of GLM, you can use LM for linear model and that's just draw a straight line and then it's literally the same syntax um, except you don't have to specify family because it understands that you're drawing a straight line. Um, but using summary, that is exactly the same for almost every model you use. Same with using tidy uh, to get just the data frame portion out. Um, and then from there, maybe you need to mutate, so that's where more data processing stuff comes into line. Um, you, can take a, you can take this and you can plot. Um, so we talked about um, some of the plots. You can make a scatter plot, really, um, where one axis is the categorical variables and the other axis is the, the center points or the odds. You can have that in there. Um, if you know the formula, you can create the error bounds and then you can use a plot to draw the error bounds for each of these coefficients. So people will end up, instead of just showing you a table of results, will plot you the actual coefficients. Um, that becomes really useful. Um, one other thing with odds, um, because it's logistic regression, um, the only possible values are from zero to infinity. If the odds is at one, so there's like a one time increased chance, anything times one means there's no change. So anything close to one means there isn't much of a change. Um, also know that the distance between zero and one on the logistic regression odd scale is the same distance from one to infinity. So if you get like 0 0.5, it's actually a really good, typically protective effect. And then if it's like 15 or some other large number, it's really a, like a not good effect. Um, but that's all how you code what means zero, what means one for your response variable. So usually the one means something bad, or that's the thing you are looking at. And pe people are typically looking at whether or not you got cancer, yes or no. Um, but so that interpretation will be a little bit different, but the way you write on that, <laughs> interpret that number is essentially the same. All right, um, any questions? I will leave it there. Um, there is one more set of slides for um, just conclusions that I want to go over. Part of it is just nice happy figures. The other part, there's actually useful stuff in here. Um, okay, so if you can, I'll just talk as this thing is loading. Please take the post-workshop survey because that is probably more important than since people have taken the pre-workshop survey, thank you so much. If you please will also take the post-workshop post survey, survey. that would be super helpful. Also in terms of planning what is coming up next or what I should plan for next. Um, the first slide here is usually a yes. So hopefully after these two days, R is not as scary as before. Um, I will tell you, you will end up, if you go through this path, there is going to be another learning curve um, more than what I've explained. So hopefully it's not as scary. Um, but what I wanted to also point out that, um, and you can look at the slides, you can take a screenshot if you're on Zoom or take a picture or I will send this back to you again. There are a bunch of resources out there. Um, the r ds book is written by the folks at our studio. Um, you can learn more about the stuff that I've presented in there. Um, for other things, there is an R4DS community that you can join on Slack. There is literally office hours that if you have R problems to, you can just join in and be like, I don't know how to pivot data or here's my data, I don't know what to do with it. There are people who volunteer to do this that's outside of here. Um, if you want more practice doing this stuff because practice is really useful, um, there's a thing on Twitter called Tidy Tuesday. Every Tuesday a data set gets released to the wild and it's just make a plot, make a figure, do something, post it on Twitter. People get to see your work. You get some motivation to do things. Um, David Robinson streams his own work doing this. He's actually very good at this. So if you want to see a bunch of different packages and seeing someone really proficient in these tools work for an hour or just have it in the background, you can do that. Um, Jessie Mastapak, I join her Twitch channel all the time and we just hang out. Uh, she streams sun Sunday doing machine learning stuff. Monday, she does a... Um, Tidy Tuesday thing, Thursday, she's literally just playing WoW or some other game. Um, the, um, over the summer, every Tuesday on Twitch, there's actually a competition called Sliced. So if you know about the food competition called Chopped, it is literally the data science fitting a model version of Chopped. So people get a data set 
for two hours and they compete to see who has the best model. And it's really interesting. <laughs> um, for those of you who are a lady um, or identify as a, a minority, you can join the Our Lady Slack channel. So if you want to ask for help, there are people all over the world that can help you with our questions, really. Um, even if you're trying to prepare for a talk, there will be people who will help you critique for that. So there is a resource for that. For those of us who work in medicine, there is a conference called R slash medicine. There's also a co conference for R pharma. If you work in the pharmaceutical companies or work in pharma, um, there's an R medicine chat uh, Slack group, and you can probably find me in any of these Slack groups except for R ladies. Um, if you want other R resources, there is a resource called Big Book of R, which is a resource of what I wrote for DS for Biomed. Like if you have some other topic, there's probably a topic there um, that's R related. Um, for us here at Virginia Tech, oh, that is, I have no idea what that is. For us here at Virginia Tech, um, there's data services. That is where uh, me and Ann are. Um, if you have questions about just data work or how to process data, how to store your data, how to do more of that data pipelining stuff, we're here to help you. Um, we're, I live in Roanoke, Ann lives in Roanoke, um, but the data services is up in Blacksburg. But um, the Center for Biostatistics and Health Data Science, literally like one floor up um, in, I think, the thousand suite. Um, Alex Hanlon runs that. She's also on my committee. Um, so if you need actual, like, more statistics help, not data processing help, uh, literally upstairs, um, you can uh, get help there. On Monday and Wednesday, they actually have office hours on Zoom. So you can literally call in and be like, I have this stats problem, or I'm thinking about the study, what are the stats I need to do? Can you help me with a power calculation? All of that stuff is available. And now that um, COVID restrictions are lessening, uh, you can probably just walk upstairs when everyone gets set up there. Um, I teach for the carpentry, so if you've ever heard of the carpentry or like, oh, this is the first time I've ever seen a technical workshop being live code in front of us. This is how I learned everything. Um, I do a lot of uh, volunteer work for them. The carpentry's main contact here at Virginia Tech is Nathaniel Porter. So if you want to learn about how I am teaching, um, you can contact him. There are a bunch of other resources from the carpentries as well. Um, so there is, if you want to know more about R as a programming language and not as a data processing language, you can. They also have really specific R material. So in ecology, genomics, geospatial, social sciences, you can all look there. Post-workshop feedback, please. And I believe that is the last thing. So thank you very much. Yes, so you can also go to like that bit.ly that says ds for biomed g drive. Like this slide deck is literally there. Um, and then after today, I will post you the link for all of the code that I wrote. Um, so that will be there, and I'll post the link to this slide deck because that's usually super helpful for folks. Um, and then sometime this week slash early next week when everything gets uploaded to YouTube, um, the recordings from this past two days will also be in that email. So be on the lookout for like two more emails, both of which will ask you to please fill out that post-workshop survey. <laughs>